history of political thought and the origins of political economy and of financial culture, particularly in Italy. Uh, by the way, his book on Machiavelli, uh, I think, significantly breaks new ground in the field of the history of Florentine Renaissance politics, uh, since it established a direct link between political struggles, public debt, and financial issues in Renaissance Florence. And one of Machiavelli's most famous statement that money is not the sinews of war. We are here eager to hear more on this subject today. Please, Jeremy. Thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> um, I, I spent several months uh, near, near Soweto in South Africa and then near Trenton in New Jersey, but uh, unfortunately my English is still uh, improving and uh, I'm still wrestling with an English accent. Um, so I will use a PowerPoint also as a kind of, um, as a kind of, um, I don't know, um, like a big car for a compensation to compensate. Uh, my paper presents some, some element of my uh, recent book, uh, L'argent n'est pas le nerf de la guerre in French. The famous sentence of Machiavelli, Monet is not the sign of war, as it is commonly supposed to be, constitutes the title of chapter 10 of book two of the Discourses on Livy. Uh, the sentence is being repeated insistently inside the chapter. According to the common interpretation of Machiavelli's sentence, there is no need to pay attention to it. It would be absurd, anachronistic, and inconsistent. Everybody knows that money is the sign of war, and Machiavelli himself recognized that money is necessary as well as a major cause of war. But what has Machiavelli said and what did he mean in writing a sentence that claims to be in complete contradiction with the common opinion? I will bring here only the necessary textual and contextual elements in order to explain and to take seriously Machiavelli's sentence. So at the center of this chapter of the discourse, one can find Machiavelli's central concept Army proprie, one's own armies. That is something one should not lack of, says Machiavelli. In general, gloss commentators uh, state that by army proprie, one's own armies, Machiavelli means troops that are not mercenaries. This negative, de negative definition already indicates the link between stipendiary armies and the cost of war. Affirming that money is not the sign of war, Machiavelli seems to bring into question the link between a determined financial system and a specific military system. This is how his contemporary Francesco Guicciardini, who defended the truth of the common opinion, has grasped this notion. By writing, I confess that he who has his own soldiers makes war with less money Guicciardini pointed out the following question. What relationship, is, uh, what relationship is there between the way to perform war with the cost of war? Machiavelli's synthetic formula indicates the direct link between the use of professional armies and the functioning of a precise financial system. It is that link that has to be considered. So there is no need nowadays to demonstrate the connection between the development of mercenarism and the increase of public debt in late medieval Florence. Antoni Molo has insisted on the material advantages taken by the small group of powerful citizens who built that, that system. David, 
David Hurley and Christian Klapisch Zuber have put into evidence the disastrous social consequences of the system of public debt, which had the effect of alienating the Tuscan population to the Florentine, Florentine territorial state. Florence behaved as a predator at the very moment when it depended more closely on the Tuscans, the people of Tuscany, Popoli. So, yeah, so, well, later maybe. Popoli, Popolo, two different things. And, uh, now, it is well known that the critique of the mercenary armies is central in Machiavelli's thought. It is also well known that the critique of the greats is also central in his thought. He affirms clearly that it is necessary to contain the appetite of domination of the greats. For this reason, Machiavelli has always been recognized as one of the, as the most ardent, ardent defender of the people. But the connection between the critic of mercenaries and the critic of the greats needs clarification. To be sure, some suggested that Machiavelli's concept of the people in arms, popolazioni armate, as in a letter to Vettori, testifies of a project of profound transformation of social relations in Tuscany. That Machiavelli's military system aims at contributing to solve the contradictions of the Florentine territorial state has been object of a fundamental debate. This debate is unachieved as of today and Recent contributions include, in particular, to my mind, Gabriele Pedula's work on Machiavelli's concept of citizenship and now on uh, the art of uh, war, and also um, Andrea uh, Guidi's uh, research on Machiavelli's scritti di uh, governo. A third way, um, maybe not there. Yeah. A third way of contributing to this debate is to show that the explicit critique of the mercenaries by Machiavelli implicitly contains a critique of the Florentine financial system. Florentine public finance is not described in Machiavelli's writings. Nevertheless, the Machiavellian judgment, money is not the sinews of war, constitutes the most tangible trace of this implicit content. From this results for us the necessity to understand better the Florentine financial system in order to interpret the meaning of his concept of the people in arms. If Machiavelli has not presented the Florentine financial system, one has to be aware of the fact that the Florentine financial system was at the heart of his historical experience, time of financial crisis. It would be presumptuous to attribute to Machiavelli an ignorance incumbent to those who have studied him and which is largely the result of discipline, disciplinary boundaries. For example, the fact of the separation between economical, political, and social history and intellectual history or the history of ideas on the other side. Machiavelli, as we all know here, was the chief of the second chancery in charge of the administration of the Florentine territory. When Machiavelli was elected by the popular Republic of the Great Council to lead the office, the Republic had to face the disaggregation of the territories, which had rebelled against the previous form of subjection established under Lorenzo il Magnifico and before. The situation dangerously destabilized the unsure foundations of the young republic born from the revolution of 1494. As the chancellor and secretary of the second chancery, Machiavelli took part in every state secrets. Secretary secrets, that's the same etymology, and it is like that in the, document, in the documents uh, stating, naming the function of Machiavelli as a secretary. Uh, through a decree dated 14th of July 1498, Machiavelli was also nominated to the service of the magistracy of the Dieci di Libertà, the Ten of War. 
in charge of military affairs and the territory's integrity and security, this magistracy was supposed to watch over the reconquest of Pisa in rebellion against Florence, as I said, since 1494. From the time he was appointed to the Secretary of the Ten of War, it was imposed upon Machiavelli to know the functioning of the financial system and to follow the specific financial dispositions that deal with the activity of this magistracy. Now, while Machiavelli started his function, this magistracy was the object of huge suspicions. A law ratified five days after Machiavelli's appointment with a large majority of uh, 815 against 187, ordered the appointment of a special investigator with judicial authority, uh, and this investigator was in charge of analyzing accounting books linked to the activities of the Ten since 1494 to punish frauds and to recover misused capitals. The law's, preamb <coughs> the law's preamble of uh, 19th of July 1498 uh, put in direct relation the lack of efficiency from the mercenary troops in charge of reconquering Pisa and the fact that the allocated sums of money were misappropriated by all sorts of means to the shame and damage, says the law of the Republic. This was the pathology. About six months later, in December 1498, another law ordered a forced, a forced loan to meet some necessities of war. The preamble of this law affirmed that the signs of war and the conservation of freedom and of a new republic is money. In the law's plateau, distinguishes the law uh, from, from its preamble. If the law means a constraint, the preamble which proceeds means consensus. It has to persuade, to exhort, to conciliate. This language of conciliation is intended to create goodwill in the persons to whom the legislators addressed the law. We observe here that the preamble of the law of December 1498 recalls the maxim pecunia nervus belli, to persuade of the need of technical decisions and policies regarding financial questions. The commonplace expression of feelings about the fatality in financial matters, the idea that ma money masters everything, aims to create pure and simple adhesion, as everybody believes that money is the nerve of war. Being written in the preamble um, of a financial law, this commonplace received a special meaning that is closely related uh, to the nature of the law as such. The cliché, money is the sign of war, cannot therefore be regarded as independent and applicable to all occasions. It is now linked to the binding mechanism of the law which is itself determined and bounded by the institution that issued this law. The language of fate appears so closely related to specific institutional arrangements, appears so closely related to specific in institutional arrangements. It represents the movement and activities of these institutional arrangements as being natural and necessary. In Florence, the institution in charge of public finance was called the Monte, meaning the mountain, for the immense accumulation of debt, of title of debt it represents. When the cliché pecunia nervus belli becomes the mode of appearing of the law, yet it reveals something of the institutional background which predetermined is specialized meaning. The technicalities of this law 
can be explained or could be explained only through an examination of the technicalities of the laws of at least the previous six months. But we don't want technique. Now, to summarize, the, the Monte creditors were divided into two categories. A minority of wealthy citizens who are creditor of short-term loans to the Republic enjoying a high interest rate, 14%. 14 while the vast majority of middle class citizens, the, po the popolo de of the Great Council, possessed rent titles in the various branches of the Monte. Short term loans were repaid through a forced loan, providing an annuity, while its capital was usually not refundable as such. Ultimately, of course, the short term loan with high interest rate was paid by taxes normally direct taxes on the population from the territories under the jurisdiction of the Florentine territory, territorial state, and also indirect taxes on consumption and circulation of commodities in the city. The officers responsible for the ma managing of the public debt were called Ufficiali del Monte. They had to advance a huge amount of money, a capital that they, they would recover at the end of their appointment plus a high interest. This led also to interest this office to members of that minority of wealthy citizens who find in what cost to the political body an extraordinary opportunity for financial investment. These officials of the Monte would elaborate the, fis the fiscal laws necessary to recover the capital they lent, and they would also supervise the collection of taxes. But the Great Council had a veto power on these laws at the time of Machiavelli. This principle of advancing money to the state was generating a structural floating debt in addition to the consolidated debt. Besides, the financial needs of the office in charge of military affairs depended on the system by which particularly wealthy or influential citizens advanced large sums of money to the ten of war. So Machiavelli was directly concerned by all that. All that, all that suppose the existence of a state that is essentially heteronomous, dependent of financial capital to satisfy a certain number among the most essential of his needs. It supposed the existence of institutional forms such as the financial capital can find markets, that is to say opportunities of investment, the link between mercenarism and government debt, the military financial complex is this form. The maxim pecunia nervus belli when incorporated into a financial law is the expression and the panegyric of this form. It aims to make people believe that this order is natural and necessary. It also aims to discredit opposition in advance because of the self-evident truth of the maxim makes it, uh, because the self-evident truth of the maxim makes it unreasonable to suggest otherwise for those who claim to change the established mode and order. Indeed, in September 1498, a representative of the Ufficiali del Monte was negotiating better guarantees for the creditors of the floating debt. He used that maximum attention was paid to maintain the credit, keep faith. Mantenere la fede, dice Machiavelli, nel capitolo 18. He proposed to, the, to uh, appoint a new Ufficiali del Monte, more independent of the Great Council and with the discretionary authority to raise money at any price and following the most convenient way, that is to say, at a, with, a, um, with a high interest rate and securing taxes necessary to ensure the service of the loan. In the consulting practice where this representative of the Ufficiali del Monte expressed this view, only one voice raised discordant as ironic as it is corrosive. Rather than increasing certain in, 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 uh, indirect taxes that affect everyone for the service of the loan 
from a small group, the financial aristocracy, taking the benefit of interest and having his capital back, why not instead make a tax on everybody, but with an amount decreased from the part that would have been otherwise necessary to the service of the loan from the Ufficiali del Monte? That way, everyone would benefit from the advantage that otherwise comes only to the financial aristocracy. The answer given during the consultation and then confirmed with the law of December 1498 was that money is the sinews of war, that it is necessary to maintain the confidence of the creditors, and that it is necessary to help to rebuild the capital that could later be used again and again. Because if you are building the capital again, you can ask to the rich to, to lend it to you again. While if it is destroyed, you can't. So this was the argument in favor of the rich. Um, but the question was already then, how to make the republic autonomous with regard to the power of finance? The normal and the pathological are indeed intertwined. Remember, the law of July 1498. I know that you took some notes. It, it was focused on the analysis of the tenth accounting books. The inquiry was extended a year later to the entire capital invested in the floating debt of the Republic. So no longer the ten of war, but the all financial aristocracy. With financial aristocracy, we are designating the group of people who had sufficient capital. I'm not talking about blood or things like that. It's a kind of um, antique regime conception. It's uh, financial aristocracy, people that can invest. Uh, a group of people who had sufficient capital to transform it in financial capital and who enjoyed the opportunities of investment offered by the state. 150 creditors could pretend as of April 1500 to be beneficiaries of a 14% interest bearing capital. 30 of them, 30 of them detained more than 85% of the total sum of the interest owed on February 1500. But the most important thing is that was discovered the system of corruption of the laws and the institutions through which the financial aristocracy weakened the Republic by artificially putting the later in a position of bankruptcy. A contemporary of Machiavelli, Piero Parenti, summarized in clear terms the situation, I quote, <coughs> uh, and I translate, the powerful took financial needs as their principal, principal asset to overthrow the state for as it was necessary for the latent to resort to the former's loans, and that the former would lend on no account, so that money was nowhere to be found. State a situation of bankruptcy. The war was seen by the people as a means for the financial aristocracy of accumulating wealth, but also, and most of all, as a means for the financial aristocracy to weaken a republic in which a large body of citizens contributes to all decisions in public affairs. Creating a situation of bankruptcy was a way for the aristocracy to take back the power that the people had increasingly gained since the revolution of 1494, and a way to increase the situation of dependence of the state on this aristocracy. Now, how to give the Republic its autonomy vis-à-vis -vis the financial power, or vis-à-vis -vis financier or profit of the confusion between private and public finance? The primary response to that was judicial, investigating on elite's corruption, and the proof were given. It results in a certain number of financial reforms, so from, so from judicial measure to financial measure, uh, such as the lowering of the floating debt's interest rate. 
as important as this can be, it has a limited impact. What you can do in terms of financial reform is limited by the very structure of the society. Machiavelli built his analysis not from the point of view of spending and cost, but from the point of view of the social organization as a whole. His response came in parallel with the judicial and financial ones. It was about arming the people, getting rid of mercenaries as much as possible, and trying to think differently the relationship between Florence and Tuscany. The Florentine aristocracy took Machiavelli's project as a major threat, and from the propaganda it developed at that time, originated the image of Machiavelli as a friend of tyrants. From that propaganda was born also the idea, still alive today, that Machiavelli's project was just unrealistic. But denying the common opinion that money is not the nerve of war, Machiavelli was not playing the fool. He was denying much more than a commonplace, and he knew it. So that's why he's constantly repeating his sentence, his negation of the sentence in his text. Discourse is book two, chapter 10, where Machiavelli is arguing that money is not the nerve of war, is in close connection with the chapter 30, book two also, in which Machiavelli explains that the ruling classes disarm the people in order to plunder them. The term used by Machiavelli is saccheggiare i popoli, saccheggiare i popoli. This is a very strong term because it suggests that ruling elite Con, con, <coughs> the, the, that the ruling elite conduct, uh, conducts a, a class war. The ordinary behavior of the ruling elite towards the people in peacetime corresponds to the extraordinary behavior of soldiers in wartime toward, towards the defeated enemy. To conclude on this aspect, I just want to point out the correspondence of the vocabulary used by Machiavelli in this chapter. And, um, and the passage of an important reform of the Monte of 1470. After the institution of the Great Council, it, it still had the value of the fundamental law, what we call a fundamental law, of the financial system. And I quote, having considered that any measures must have as origins and basis the monte, and that therefore it is essential to regulate and help this institution because everyone understands that the monte is the earth of our body called city, and as it is necessary for each member, large or small, to contribute as conveniently as he can to the conservation of such a earth, which is like the guardian, the strong place, and the, and the sure foundation of the salvation of the whole body and government and state which is yours, etc., etc. Now, this is the parodic treatment that Machiavelli reserves for this law of 1470. Hence, the states do not realize that this approach by disarming the peoples to be able to plunder them goes against all good order. For it is the earth and the vital parts of a body that must be kept armed, not the extremities. When you are using ex mercenaries, you are just arming the extremities. Because without them, we live. But when the former is injured, you die. And these states keep the earth disarmed, by disarming the people, and hands and feet armed. In no other chapter of the discourses, in no other pages of his works, Machiavelli used this metaphor of the earth and the part of society. The correspondence between the vocabulary used by Machiavelli and the one by the law of 1470 seems to me to be striking. It seems to me extremely significant that Machiavelli is doing it in a textual context in which the weakness of society is being sought from the links that, you, that unite the defensive system, the financial system, and the interest of a predatory elite. Machiavelli aimed at defending society against 
against that sort of men which were working in cool blood and with open eyes to ruin their native country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, for this. Uh, I think it's time now uh, to open the debate. If anybody has questions, Filippo. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, very beautiful paper, of course. Uh, um, I have one question on, uh, yeah, war, of course, the, the most striking uh, definition or quasi-definition that Machiavelli gives of war. As always, I find them exceptional. Like, the, the, the aim of war is to make yourself richer and the enemy poorer, which is not bad. And the second one is even better. The, the, the target, the, the prey of the unarmed poor is the rich. Sorry, the, the armed poor is the rich unarmed. Uh, now, on, on this way, you don't touch so much, and that's my, where my question comes. The, the war as an enterprise, the fact that a uh, successful war repays for itself, which is all the, 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 the sense of the, the question of the Catastro Law 1427, which you don't talk about a lot. How do you to bring this into the picture? The fact that a successful war, in fact, repays for itself. John is, John is inviting me to, to respond in, uh, in French. But uh, the question is, uh, do I have a clear idea about what to respond to that? And, uh, and uh, <coughs> I'm sorry? Uh, oui, excusez-moi. Uh, bon, alors, on peut revenir, on peut reprendre uh, uh, la question de... Bon, uh, d'abord, je... La, situation que tu, la, la citation que tu as donnée uh, au nom de l'art de la guerre, uh, c'est-à-dire que le... Le prix du soldat pauvre, c'est le riche désarmé. Cette, cette citation vient dans un contexte où, où Machiavel paraphrase Végès. Et c'est assez amusant de voir que souvent, les, certains commentateurs ont, ont, ont vu que la paraphrase de Végès et n'ont pas vu les phrases introduites par Machiavel, dont celle-ci que l'on trouve nulle part ailleurs que chez Machiavel et qui, qui donne le, le, le sens de, de, de son projet de « Population et armate ». Donc je te remercie vraiment, de... c'est une citation ext extrêmement importante. Ensuite, il est sûr que dans la construction de, de l'État territorial florentin, tout l'enjeu, mais ça c'était clairement vu euh, y a, dans, le, dans le Gramsci euh, que, que je trouve utile, euh, ce n'est pas le Gramsci du, du prince moderne, ça c'est le Gramsci, euh, mais c'est le Gramsci, qui a, le Gramsci qui, qui, qui a une connaissance historique, et c'est le, le, le Gramsci qui, qui donne des pistes, qui, 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 c est, c est, qui donne des pistes de travail. Et, euh, et il lit des, des livres extrêmement importants, et notamment un d'un certain Bernardino Barbadoro, qui est un des premiers livres sur les, les finances publiques florentines, sur la période qui précède la fondation du, du Monte. Et euh, Gramsci cueille, en termes extrêmement clairs, le fait que l'enjeu euh, de la construction de l'État territorial euh, florentin c'était aussi d'élargir la base de taxation pour rembourser la dette. Donc, euh, voilà une clé de réponse euh, directe euh, sur un, un, un des problèmes majeurs de la construction de l'État, c'est aussi d'élargir, évidemment, alors dans, un, dans une perspective qu'on connaît bien, c'est-à-dire d'élargir des, euh, des marchés pour les marchands, mais aussi d'élargir la base de l'impôt euh, pour repayer la dette. Euh, donc il est évident que dans la politique de conquête, euh, dans la, la, le développement de l'Empire, parce que qu'est-ce que c'est l'Empire chez Machiavel C'est d'abord la Toscane. Euh, dans l'élargissement de l'Empire, c'est un enjeu. Maintenant, justement, ce qu'il y a de, 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 de fort chez, chez Machiavel, c'est que Machiavel qui va, qui va travailler 
à la reconquête de Pise. Et là, Andrea a, a, a apporté quelques documents aussi qui sont très importants là-dessus. C'est qu'il va quand même, euh, euh, certes, euh, contribuer, euh, et sa milice va avoir un rôle majeur pour sou soumettre Pise, donc ramener Pise dans le giron de Florence. Euh, Andrea a montré que dans certains euh, textes euh, de Machiavel, dans certains des scrits du gouverne, il y a une négociation qui se met en place avec les pisans pour arriver à des conditions qui soient nettement plus favorables que l'état de soumission et, euh, dans lequel ils étaient avant. Donc il est clair que, que pour Machiavel, les guerres qui sont absurdes, ce sont les guerres qui euh, coûtent plus cher à la population euh, et, qui, et, qui ne, et qui ne rapporte pas. Euh, il, se, il se trouve que l'aristocratie euh, florentine avait réussi à mettre en place un système euh, de guerre dans lequel ça coûtait cher à tout le monde et ça lui rapportait à elle. C'est-à-dire c'est une formule extrêmement simple de euh, socialisation des coûts et privatisation des bénéfices euh, que, que nous pouvons observer euh, toujours euh, à l'œuvre. Please feel free to introduce yourself if you uh, want. I'm John. <laughs> Jeremy, marvelous paper, really terrific. Um, two questions. One, uh, could you bring Sorodini into the picture here? Um, because Sorodini, I understand that Sorodini, one of the reasons for his election was his reputation as a financial wizard, and he was supposed to be the maestro to get the Monti under control. Um, and so was this part of the story of Sorodini being cast as a class traitor, that his, did he favor Machiavelli's proposal perhaps too much and then the Ottomati thought we were getting a wizard of the Monti and now we have someone who wants to replace the Monti with uh, an armed citizenry. So is that part of the story? The second thing, um, uh, your quote from uh, book two, chapter 30, makes me see for the first time that Machiavelli is complete, completely reversing the speech of the senators to the plebeians early in Livy when they convinced the plebeians to come back from their secession because we the Senate are the stomach of the city who have to distribute the, the goods that you provide as plebeians have to be distributed through the stomach, through the trunk. So the, the plebeians, according to the, to the senators, are the extremities and we, we are the trunk. And Machiavelli is completely inverting that and saying, no, it's the patricians who are the extremity and it's the armed populace that is the heart in the, in the trunk. So could you speak to that perhaps as well? Uh, uh, for the second point, I know I cannot say much more than what I said. Uh, I mean, yeah, well, I could say more about what I said, but just uh, not as related to Livy because I don't have... Mm, I don't have this, uh, this uh, Livy in mind. Uh, so thank you. Just what I can say is just thank you very much for, I will, I will, I will go back on Livy's text. As regards to Soderini, um, thank you for, for, thank you very much for this question. Um, yes, one of, uh, one of the things that I can, that I have established and, and I can prove is that the financial policy followed by Soderini was uh, established before him and as a result of uh, um, popular success. So basically, when uh, Soderini arrived in charge, uh, he was himself was one of the top 10 uh, financial aristocrats that I can name. So for the financial aristocracy, it could, it could be perceived clearly as an ally, uh, as, an ally as he, wa he was one of them. Concerning his experience before, He was member of the ten, member of the Ufficiale del Monte, so for sure he has an experience. Now, what, when we are talking about um, the financial experience in terms of, uh, of Soderini, we have in mind, historians have in mind, pages by uh, Giovanni Cambi, the historian mainly, Giovanni Cambi, who wrote uh, pages concerning um, uh, Soderini uh, decision to present his, uh, his, um, his financial work during the last, uh, from uh, 1502 to 1511. So he was trying, because he was accused also of prevarication and et cetera, et cetera. So he was trying to defend himself uh, against his enemies and the calumny of his enemies. And the way was to, uh, to, to, 
to, to prove that he did well with finance. Um, we don't have uh, this uh, book of account uh, right now, so we don't know exactly. But what I can say, which seems to me extremely important, is that historians from uh, François Thomas Perens and after that repeated the statement about Soderini good financial management, which is part of Soderini's own defense, which is fine, but that, le that led to forget what was done before Soderini in, in terms of finance. And, and because of the institutional change of 1502, uh, we tend to study uh, 1494 to 1502 as a whole, and 1502, 1512 as a whole, but indeed no, nobody has studied that carefully, except Humphrey Butters uh, in a book uh, called Governors and, Govern and, and Government, but it's not a, uh, Humphrey Butters has no um, sensibility toward financial question and to political opposition. It just sees the history as a history of family, as a business of family, which is extremely, uh, uh, I mean, for the time of the Republic of the Great Council, it seems c completely anachronistic in a sense. Um, so, so the study of, of um, 1502, 1512 still has to be done it historically carefully. And the date, the split of 1502 has to be uh, reconsidered. And it's more important to consider for, from the death of, San, of Savonarola to 1512 as a, as a unity. I think there is time for more questions, please. Merci beaucoup, c'est fascinant. Uh, évidemment, la... la la découverte des, ou la redécouverte des, des analogies euh, à des époques apparemment euh, éloignées les unes des autres euh, entre les, 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 les euh, pardon ma phrase est mal partie je veux dire découverte de la, de la façon dont des, des constantes je dirais dans, dans l'histoire des rapports entre le capitalisme financier et euh, euh, la dette publique est quelque chose de tout à fait fascinant. Alors ça fonctionne euh, vers le présent, mais est-ce que ça fonctionne aussi vers le passé euh, Ma question précisément est celle-ci. Euh, qu'est-ce qu'on savait à l'époque de Machiavel et qu'est-ce que Machiavel pouvait savoir euh, lui-même euh, du fonctionnement des, des finances euh, euh, romaines euh, du rapport entre la, la fonction des, des publicains euh, et, et, le, et, la, et, le, et le financement de la, de la, de la conquête euh, euh, à Rome et, et est-ce est que s'il en avait su quelque chose ça aurait pu lui inspirer en partie les réflexions sur lesquelles nous discutons aujourd'hui compte tenu euh, de l'analogie euh, permanente chez lui entre la, la, la Rome impériale et les ambitions euh, contemporaines de, de Florence, euh, et compte tenu du fait que euh, Rome est quand même le grand exemple d'une euh, puissance dont, euh, militaire euh, qui est construite sur euh, l'armement du peuple. Bon, là, à nouveau, il y a une autre, euh, <coughs> il y a une autre limite. Là, euh, il y a bien sûr arrivé à établir ce que savait euh, Machiavel. Euh, je crois que c'est encore plus rapide euh, d'établir ce que je sais moi euh, des finances, euh, des finances des Romains, mais euh, qui est, qui est plus, probablement plus bref que, euh, que, ça, que ce que, savait, que pouvait savoir Machiavel, parce que <coughs> Machiavel avait certainement lu de manière beaucoup plus étendue que je n'ai l'ai fait jusqu'à maintenant. Euh, les historiens romains qui étaient disponibles en son temps, il est sûr qu'ils ne pouvaient pas savoir bien au-delà de, euh, de ce qui était dedans. Maintenant, est-ce que les historiens spécialistes des finances romaines d'aujourd'hui savent plus que ce qu'il y avait, euh, quelles sont les sources dont ils disposent dans, oui, alors effectivement, bon, j'ai lu aussi un petit peu, un petit peu Nicolet. C'est vrai que quand j'ai commencé à me poser la question de Machiavel et, et l'économie, euh, c'est vrai que je... Quand je me suis posé la question de Machiavel et l'économie, c'est vrai que je suis allé voir un petit peu euh, l'économie des Grecs et des Romains, et puis euh, Karl Polanyi et des gens comme ça, pour voir comment raisonner. Mais enfin, il y a un moment, euh, de f... il y a une différence radicale. Et la différence radicale, c'est ce qui se passe dans les années 1340-1350. C'est la, la consolidation de la dette publique. 
Est-ce qu'il y a ça dans l'histoire de Rome euh, Je n'ai pas l'impression que dans les études qui ont été faites euh, sur les financiers, les banquiers, parce qu'il y a surtout un livre de Jean Andrault euh, qui est publié, voilà, que... Voilà, donc pour, pour moi, c'est ce vers ce livre que maintenant je me dirigerai, euh, en plus des, des travaux de Nicolet. Mais euh, euh, je, je n'ai pas... Pour les consultations que j'ai pu faire euh, de ce genre d'ouvrage, je n'ai rien trouvé qui puisse approcher de cette histoire, de la consolidation de la dette, qui a des conséquences énormes. Parce qu'avec la consolidation de la dette dans les années 1340-1350... Les juristes et les théologiens vont se mettre à raisonner dans des termes absolument neufs sur les questions de l'usure, alors qu'ils peut-être ne concernaient pas exactement dans les mêmes termes non plus que euh, les Romains, que, que la chrétienté par la suite. Mais c'est à ce moment-là qu'une une, une réflexion sur les finances publiques qui va permettre de sortir de la réflexion sur l'usure, et ça ce sont les travaux de, de Julius Kirchner qui ont été à Chicago, qui ont été extrêmement importants après ceux de Raymond de Rouver, enfin bon, il y a une, il y a une tradition, mais c'est ce moment-là de fondation qui est extrêmement important et qui joue aussi une importance, parce que finalement, si on cherche les références au monté dans l'œuvre de Machiavel, et quand je dis l'œuvre de Machiavel, je veux dire l'œuvre majeure, eh bien on n'en trouve pas tant que ça. On en trouve en fait une importante, et dans le cadre du tumulte des Ciampi. Alors, que voulaient les, le, que voulaient les Ciampi C'était réformer ces systèmes financiers dont bénéficiait juste un petit groupe... Euh, de gens euh, et eux se retrouvaient avec un système qui pouvait euh, avec euh, euh, enfin, tout, le, tout, tout le poids de la dette de devoir payer les, les intérêts de la dette c'est ce système là que les Ciampi voulaient euh, je ne me rappelle plus là, exactement la, la formule très précise de Machiavel dans le discours de l'anonyme Ciampo mais elle est radicale et c'est voilà après il faut chercher les pages quand, euh, qui sont extrêmement difficiles d'ailleurs à interpréter quand euh, Machiavel parle du, de San Giorgio de, de Gênes et, bon. et ensuite, euh, sur des, des textes beaucoup plus tardifs, comme euh, euh, la Minuta di Provisione per la Riforma dello Stato di Firenze del 1522, eh, quand euh, il, a, euh, il cherche à, euh, à transiger un petit peu en, en offrant la possibilité à... Euh, au groupe qui serait en charge des finances, d'avoir davantage d'autorité financière pour éviter les blocages qui avaient été ceux de la République à l'époque de la République sur les questions financières. Euh, mais euh, comme le discursus Florentina Rum Rerum et la Minuta, ce sont des, des textes qui visent, qui sont dans un contexte très particulier et qui visent à des solutions temporaires jusqu'à ce que le Grand Conseil aurait retrouvé ses pleins pouvoirs, c'est-à-dire son pouvoir de veto. Donc euh, voilà, voilà, comment, voilà comment je peux répondre pour le moment. Thank you, thank you very much. I think it's time now uh, for John to start his talk. Thank you. Thank you.